Good morning and a virtual welcome to all of you to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. I am Maria Mercedes Tuya and under the Computing Administration Department, responsible for the Digital Scholarship Initiative at the Institute. <clears throat> During the academic year, we organize these digital scholarship conversations, hoping to provide the community with knowledge of digital tools and projects of relevance to the different areas of scholarship covered by the four schools at the Institute. In today's presentation, a virtual open house to Craderos, Dr. Aaron Herkowitz, <clears throat> sorry, will give us a front row view of the effort to digitize the Institute's unique collection of squeezes of ancient Greek inscriptions, a project led by Angelos Haniotis, professor in the School of Historical Studies, that is available through open access as part of Albert, the IAS Institutional Repository. This project is funded by the uh, Humanities Collections and Reference Resource Grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and by generous gifts in memory of Fowler Merle, Merle Smith and from the Charles and Lisa Simoni Funds for Arts and Sciences. Our speaker, Aaron Herskowitz, is the manager of the Craterus Project and a research associate in the School of Historical Studies. He received his BA from the University of Maryland and his PhD from Rutgers University, where his thesis focused on democrat democratic politicians in fifth century BCE Athens. His work in digital epigraphy has been recognized with several awards, including the Fulbright Fellowship in 2014-15. There will be time for after the presentation to address questions and discussions. Please use the chat tool to submit them even during the presentation. Aaron, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Maria, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining today. Uh, so the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to share a video um, that'll be about 20 minutes. That's kind of the, the main body of the tour. Uh, and I did this to try to avoid uh, any of the technical issues that would undoubtedly come if I were just to pick up my laptop and wander around the room uh, and hope for the best that way. Um, so I'm going to share this video. Um, and then when the video concludes, uh, we'll do Q&A. And I'll be happy to grab items from the various spots in the room um, or answer any questions, chat about any aspects of the Squeeze Collection, uh, the Merit Library, the Crateros Project, uh, anything that you may have in that respect. So let's kick off our video presentation. Hello, and welcome to the Craterhaus Open House. I'm Aaron Hershkowitz, the manager of the Craterhaus Project to digitize the Squeeze Collection at the Institute for Advanced Study, and I'll be your tour guide today. The Squeeze Collection has occupied the same room, often called the Merit Library, for the entirety of its existence. Before the beginning of the Craterhaus Project, the space also served as the office first of Benjamin Dean Merritt and then of Christian Habicht. On your left, when you enter the Merit Library, is the heart of the collection, a long wall of boxes containing most of the Institute's nearly 30,000 squeezes. The boxes and shelving were designed by Merit himself, who was one of the first professors of humanistic studies at the Institute, and who arranged for the creation of the majority of the squeeze collection in the mid-1930s. Let's take a look in one of the boxes. The squeezes are organized by corpus of publication or by inventory number. Merritt's primary area of interest was the history of Attica, the region of Greece surrounding Athens, and he was responsible for publishing the inscriptions found in the excavation of the ancient Athenian Agora by the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. As a result, the IAS squeeze collection has a heavy focus on Attic materials, although we do possess squeezes from the rest of the ancient Greek world. Squeezes, for anyone who may not be familiar, are essentially paper negatives of a textured surface. 
In the case of the Institute collection, the squeezes are epigraphic, meaning that they record texts carved mainly into stone. Our boxes generally contain somewhere between 40 and 200 squeezes, depending upon the size of the individual squeezes. The squeezes are carefully stacked inside of the boxes to avoid bending and to keep them in the appropriate order. You may have noticed that it is relatively difficult to see the letters on the squeezes as I've been flipping through them. This difficulty can be ameliorated by the application of low-angle raking light, which I am providing here with my cell phone flashlight. The squeezes are much easier to read in person, but the truth is that conventional photography struggles to capture and display the letters on a squeeze. This is one of the main reasons that the Crateros project uses a scanner with special 3D lighting, which you will see in action a little bit later on. The box that we are currently looking through contains squeezes of inscriptions published in the second edition of Inscriptiones Graecae II, a series of volumes covering inscriptions from Attica produced after 403 BCE. Specifically, this box pertains to inscriptions IG22, as they are called, numbers 690 through 739. Initially, the squeezes in the Institute collection were only labeled with information about the inscriptions from which they were made. They had no unique identifying numbers, and so, in cases where more than one squeeze of a given inscription existed in the collection, there was no way to refer to a specific squeeze. One part of the Crateros project's work has been to thoroughly catalog the squeeze collection, noting the preservation state of each squeeze, and providing them with unique IAS numbers. Most of the squeezes in the collection are in very good physical condition, especially for paper objects that are over 85 years old, but we take great care when handling and scanning the squeezes to prevent further damage. Since you've now seen the squeezes, let's have a look at the results of the Crateros digitization process. We'll stay with this box and focus on IG22691, an inscription for which the Institute has two squeezes. This is Albert, the Institutional Repository for the IAS, which hosts images of our digitized squeezes with some attendant metadata to facilitate searching and browsing. First, I navigate to the Crateros community, and then to the Inscriptiones Graecae 2-2 subcollection. Then I search for 691 in that collection. At the top of the entry page is information about the inscription, and below are four images, two for each squeeze. When we come back around to the scanning process, I will explain why we scan each squeeze twice. Squeezes are not all that we have in the Merit Library. The library was designed as a state-of-the-art laboratory for epigraphic study, and in addition to the squeezes, Merit collected a formidable epigraphic library. Most of those books have recently been moved into the Historical Studies and Social Science Library to increase their accessibility for members, visitors, and faculty, but a few volumes remain for use by the Crateros Project staff. What I've just picked up, though, is more special than your average epigraphic tome. While he was preparing the inscriptions of the Athenian Agora for publication, Merritt kept extensive notebooks of his work, with at least a page dedicated to each fragment unearthed in the excavations. There is a great deal of variety in what Merritt recorded about various inscriptions, ranging from as little as the word no, with an exclamation point, to extensive drawings, transcriptions, discussion, and bibliography. A frequent feature of the notebooks is experimentation with the restoration of inscriptions. Nearly all inscriptions are fragmentary. That is, only a part of the original text survives. One of the main jobs of the epigraphist is to attempt to reconstruct the missing part of an inscription based upon comparison with other, similar texts, and upon the amount of space available to fit letters into. Although most of the information in the Merit Notebooks has been published, they are still valuable as historical objects in their own right, 
and for the glimpse that they provide into the living process of epigraphical research and publication. As you may have noticed, the notebooks are not in the best of conditions. After we have digitized the Squeeze collection, we hope to have the opportunity to digitize and rehouse the Merit notebooks. As we continue to move around the room, we pass by the cluster of desks and computers where, in non-pandemic times, the members of the Crateros project team gather to carry out the project's work. We are fortunate to have access to a full bound set of the Pauli Visova Real Encyclopedia der Klassischen Altertumswissenschaft, an old but unsurpassed encyclopedia of classical scholarship. We also have an extensive collection of analog information about the fragments from the Agora excavations, more testament to the deep connection between the Institute Squeeze Collection and the American School of Classical Studies. As part of the record keeping necessary for good scientific archaeology, the Agora excavation creates information cards for every object that they unearth. In the Merritt Library, we have a card catalog with replicas of the excavation cards for every inscription discovered in the Agora. Beneath it is a filing cabinet with photographs of the fragments. I will pull out the cards and pictures pertaining to one particular inscription, Agora Inventory Number I-4408, and bring them to the table for a better look. Unlike the cards in the American School collection, which have been updated over time, the cards at the Institute were left largely unchanged. Thus, although they often note connections between fragments, whether by labeling, stapling, or direct comment, they do not have the diachronic bibliographical information of the cards at the American School. Fortunately, the American School has digitized the cards from its collection, and they can be searched and viewed at ASCSA.net. The cards record a variety of information, most of which is more archaeologically centered than epigraphically centered. Unlike the Merit Notebooks, which very much focus on the text of the inscriptions, the cards focus on the fragments as objects, including the date, place, and context of discovery, the type of stone or marble, a description of the fragment's length, width, and height, as well as if or where it has broken off, and any decorative or architectural elements. For ease of reference, many of the cards also have miniature photographs of their fragments stapled to them. In most cases, there are larger versions of the same photographs in the filing cabinet, and for these cards, we will see those photographs in a moment. The photographs in the collection serve as an aid in the research and publication of the inscriptions. The most authoritative way to publish the text of an inscription is by autopsy, that is, by working with the inscription firsthand. Every quirk and foible of the stone can be examined closely by sight and touch under different conditions so that the epigraphist can be as sure as possible about the letters. However, it is not always possible to work directly with an inscription. Often, simply because one cannot travel to the inscription and vice versa. A second best option, especially before the advent of 3D digitization, was the combined use of squeezes and photographs. The photographs capture the visual information about the fragments, while the squeezes capture the depth information. Many of these photographs were also included as part of Merritt's publication of the inscriptions from the Agora excavation. It was expected that in most cases inscriptions would be published with photographs to allow other epigraphists the opportunity to verify the proposed readings. One final card catalog rounds out the set of major supporting materials in the Merritt Library. That catalog contains a prosopography of ancient Athens, a more or less exhaustive list of the known names of people who lived in or were connected to Athens and Attica, along with the sources, literary or documentary, in which those people appear. Inscriptions are a critical source for prosopographical information, and Merritt, 
recognizing that the thousands of new inscriptions whose publication he was responsible for would include tens of thousands of names, hired assistants to transcribe the major existing overview of Attic prosopography and to update that material as his work progressed. Anytime a name appeared in an inscription, it could be associated with an existing person, or a header for a possibly new person could be created. For several decades, this card catalog was the single most important resource for the study of Attic prosopography, and scholars would travel from around the world to work with it. On the cards here, we have a name that may be recognizable to many of you, Alcibiades. There are a variety of persons who possess that name, but the most famous is Alcibiades, son of Cleinias, from the Deme Scambonidae, a general and politician in the late 5th century BCE. In the 1970s, John S. Trail, now a professor emeritus at the University of Toronto, began a sort of spiritual predecessor to the Crateros project when he embarked on an effort to digitize the Merit card catalog. After entering the card information into an early computer database and providing some updates of his own, he published the material in the 21-volume Persons of Ancient Attica series. In this cabinet, we have a variety of squeezes and notebooks related to northern Greece and ancient Macedonia. Most of these materials came to the Institute as a bequest from the epigraphist Charles Edson, along with notebooks describing his archaeological and epigraphical work that are a bit like a cross between the Agora note cards and Merritt's notebooks. For now, we'll use two of the squeezes from this cabinet to explore the scanning procedure that the Crateros project deploys. We use a WideTech 25 flatbed scanner with an imaging area of 18 and a half by 25 inches. We have two of them at the Institute, one in the Merritt Library and one in the Historical Studies and Social Science Library. The only difference between the two scanners is that we have detached the lid on the scanner in the Merritt Library, and I'll explain why momentarily. When scanning squeezes, we try, where at all possible, to follow a uniform procedure. First, the squeeze is placed on the scanner bed with the face of the squeeze, that is, the side that was in direct contact with the stone fragment, face down on the glass, and the text oriented in a normal, upright position. In the WideTech Scanner program, we have a preset configuration of settings. We scan in grayscale because any color information on the squeeze is extraneous to the information from the inscription. We use the 3D lighting that I had mentioned earlier to provide low angle raking light. And we create 600 DPI TIFF files for archival purposes. After the first scan has been saved, we rotate the squeeze 90 degrees clockwise and scan it a second time. We do this because the raking light from the 3D lighting does a much better job of highlighting perpendicular features than parallel ones. Thus, where a vertical line might appear strongly in one scan, but a horizontal line faintly if at all, a rotated scan will show just the opposite. The combination of the two images will thus capture all of the features relatively well. The two images can also be combined with a process called shape from shading that produces an approximated 3D representation of the squeeze. But what happens when a squeeze does not fit on the scanner bed? After all, not every squeeze in the IAS collection is as small as the one that I just scanned. Some are downright huge, up to 5 feet by 10 feet. To demonstrate the answer to this question, we turn to a second, larger squeeze. This squeeze fits on the scanner bed in one direction and can be scanned that way without any problem. However, when it has been turned 90 degrees, the entirety of the squeeze can no longer fit on the imaging surface. Either the top or the bottom of the squeeze gets cut off. To address this issue, instead of trying to capture the entire squeeze in one image, we take two images with enough overlap to stitch the images together using Photoshop's photo merge utility. We cannot accomplish this by turning the squeeze around because the raking light would make the two images incompatible. The squeeze must remain in the same orientation. 
It is for this reason that the hinges holding the lid of the scanner on have been detached. Otherwise, they would prevent us from successfully imaging squeezes larger than the scanner bed. Even after we have photo merged the images, we keep the original partial images so that anyone worried about distortions introduced by photo merging can access unaltered scans. All of our scanned images, regardless of whether they're photo merged, have several adjustments made in Photoshop to improve readability. Specifically, we reduce the brightness and increase the contrast of the images. We also rotate the images so that the text is oriented upright, and we unmirror them. Since the squeezes are negatives, they read like mirror images, but it is easy and unobtrusive to fix this aspect in Photoshop. Just as with the photo merged files, we keep unaltered archival copies of every scan. Before we wrap up the tour, a little glimpse into the future of the Crateros project for you. When the project was awarded an NEH grant last year, the grant plan included applying 3D digitization to the collection, in addition to the two-dimensional scanning that you've just seen. At the end of March, project associate Maria O'Leary and I spent three days conducting test photography for photogrammetry, a type of imaging that uses a carefully captured image set from a DSLR camera to create a highly accurate 3D mesh of an object. With consultation from Cultural Heritage Imaging, we are currently working to determine the appropriate equipment and workflow to 3D image as much of the collection as accurately as possible over the next two years. The resulting 3D models will be useful in a variety of respects. For one thing, they capture a much more detailed snapshot of the squeezes in the collection, which can be used both for epigraphic work as well as curatorial work. They also add an additional layer of data for potential analysis by neural networks and AI algorithms, and can even be 3D printed to create pedagogical tools for instructors without easy access to inscriptions or squeezes. As I return our squeezes to the cabinet, we round into the end of our tour. All that remains now is to thank our funders, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Charles and Lisa Simone Fund for Arts and Sciences, and funding in memory of Fowler Merle Smith. And thanks to all of you for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed the tour and that you'll come visit in person when normal travel is possible again. hope that you enjoyed the video. Um, and uh, now I'm very happy to uh, answer or do my best to answer any questions that you may have um, or snag any objects to try to bring them over. Although um, we're a little limited by the webcam that we have here, which is uh, not going to do quite as good a job of capturing things as the, the camera that I used for the video. Okay, so um, yeah, I have a, a question in the chat um, from Paula. Um, do you have a system for describing the preservation state of the squeezes? Uh, and if so, would you be willing to share it? Um, yeah, so we do have a system for that. Um, a lot of which comes down to um, kind of abbreviations um, so that you can make notations for yourself relatively quickly um, while you're going through and cataloging the materials. 
Um, and when we um, had the CCAHA, um, who are a, a cultural heritage um, conservation group, come by to assess the collection, um, they gave us a little bit of an overview of the types of damage um, that are particularly important in uh, assessing how, how likely um, a squeeze or a paper piece of art um, is to lose structural integrity um, and thence um, kind of how much it would cost to repair those kinds of issues. Um, so we have a, kind of a, a, a written up sheet that describes what the major notes are um, and how we write them. And I'm, I'm happy to share that um, with anyone who's interested because um, it's it's a lot of it and it will depend a little bit on on your particular collection um, a lot of it uh, circle is around things like tape and staples um, which are often applied but not always applied and so we're looking for things like you know does it have staples have the staples rusted are the staples necessary to hold the squeeze or squeezes together does it have tape did it have tape is there tape residue on there um, does that residue actually impact your ability to read the squeezes or is it just um, kind of there because as I said when we were doing the um, scanning in some ways the color information isn't that important so if all you've got is a little bit of discoloration um, then you know you have to think about whether that's something that you would you want to address or not let's see okay um, and Kevin Clinton had a question. Is Crateros acquiring squeezes of new documents uh, that have recently been published? Um, and I think um, Angelos could speak to this a little bit, but I, I think in general, we're very happy to receive um, squeezes that are being produced of more recent excavations uh, or newer documents or that sort of thing, um, because we don't specifically run um, excavations, we don't necessarily go out to make new squeezes, or, or that's not something that we've done um, to this point. But certainly if um, individual scholars who have collections of squeezes um, are unsure about how to um, kind of ensure that that collection of squeezes will continue to be used um, and accessed and preserved, um, after they're no longer using that collection, um, where we are happy to take collections on and, and add them to what we have. I can say a couple of words. Um, essentially, what um, uh, Aaron said is um, uh, correct. That is, we do not systematically collect new uh, squeezes, uh, but we do have... Um, uh, some uh, offers either by people who have come to the Institute as members or by members of the Institute. For instance, I will uh, give to the collection the squeezes that I have made, not many, in uh, aphrodisias. And aphrodisias, there is a difficulty that um, uh, sometimes you run the risk when you export squeezes uh, that you are going to be stopped at the customs and uh, try to explain to the customs officer that you are not stealing uh, valuable Turkish antiquities. Uh, but we uh, also, I have uh, squeezes from uh, Crete. Uh, we're starting an excavation in Litos on Crete. So squeezes that are going to be made there are going to be also part of the collection. But I think that the most important thing is what uh, Aaron said. We already have a valuable collection. So uh, if uh, any one of you has a collection of squeezes and doesn't know what to do with them, um, uh, we are uh, more than willing to <laughs> provide a house for them. Um, uh, and we're also in cooperation with other digitization projects, for instance, the uh, Berlin Academy of Sciences that has uh, probably the largest collection of the squeezes uh, of squeezes in the world. The uh, Inscriptiones Greca uh, collection are also planning to digitize them uh, following the same more or less uh, model that we do. Uh, thanks, Aaron, for this uh, very nice presentation. Thank you, Angelos. Uh, and, and good luck with the vaccine, that's, uh, that's very exciting. Um, so I have a question from Alexander Nagel. Um, 
On Western Asia squeezes, um, Iraq and Iran, uh, we have in the Smithsonian, I investigated since 2009 and published, um, we do have pigments. Have you identified any traces of paint? Um, so to my knowledge, we haven't identified any traces of paint on the squeezes. Um, it's not something that we have systematically looked for while I've been here. Um, it's something that we would be we will be more likely to catch um, using the 3D um, digitization, the photogrammetry, uh, assuming that that's the, the technique that we move forward with, because since that's done um, with a, a DSLR and in color, um, it will capture that kind of information. Um, but we haven't done tests um, specifically designed to detect uh, pigmentation. Um, and I'll say that I, I haven't noticed um, any kind of obvious instances of that. Um, it's possible that um, some of it, if it did exist, may have worn away over the 80, 85 years that um, a lot of these were used. Um, but it is, it's certainly possible that that does exist on some of the squeezes um, and that we'll hopefully um, find that out as we continue with the project. Okay, um, question from Mariana. Um, do you have any squeezes of unpublished inscriptions? Uh, and if you do, where do they come from? Yes, um, we have actually quite a few squeezes of unpublished inscriptions from several places. Um, we the kind of heart of the collection, um, which was made by Merritt in the 30s, the mid 30s, um, was made from the Agora um, collection, the inscriptions in the Epigraphical Museum um, in Athens uh, and uh, some of the uh, peripheral areas of Attica. So Eleusis, um, the Acropolis, those um, spots. And a fair number of the inscriptions both in the Epigraphical Museum uh, and at the Agora have still not to this point been published. Um, and so those squeezes are um, more restricted. Um, so when we put images up um, on Albert, the open access images, um, those are only of inscriptions that have already been published. Um, we have, we do digitize all of the, the squeezes because uh, it's a preservation thing, um, just as much as it's, it's an open access thing. Um, and we try to keep an eye on um, new publications. And this is made somewhat easier by Angelos being in charge of the SEG. So he has a, a pretty good idea about new uh, epigraphic publications. Um, and as things are published, we can add them to the list of, of things that are kind of openly and publicly available. Um, and we also have um, some kind of sub collections, uh, including some set of squeezes uh, from Louis Robert, um, some of which again are uh, of unpublished inscriptions and, and the same caveats apply to those. Okay. Um, Marilyn has a question. Do you have a search method for matching fragments? Uh, no. Um, it's something that I I was interested in um, going back to when I was doing um, photogrammetry and RTI, um, so 3D digitization work with uh, inscriptions directly um, a little bit at the Epigraphical Museum in the Agora um, in Athens back in 2014, 2015. Um, my, my feeling about it um, is that I'm not sure that the digitization of the squeezes specifically um, will help with uh, kind of matching up fragment pieces for inscriptions that uh, perhaps join, but joins haven't been identified for, um, because a lot of that join work is done either by virtue of uh, identifying um, common text um, so seeing that something must join because uh, the letters are the same and then it, it becomes apparent that um, we're, we're talking about the same um, issue in the inscription or by noticing physical joins. And the physical joins are usually going to be uh, sides of the fragments. And of course the squeezes don't really capture the sides of the fragments. They're um, almost exclusively made of the face, uh, the inscribed face of the fragment. So, um, there's some work being done 
using AI um, and neural networks to try to reconstruct um, texts. Uh, I know um, Tia Summershield um, is one of the, the big drivers on a project working on that um, at Oxford uh, and in Europe. Um, and that kind of work may start to help with um, matching up fragments um, on the textual side. And then if this kind of digitization is applied to uh, fragments, stone fragments in the round, um, I think that there is a lot of potential for um, creating computer programs that will be good at, at trying to say, hey, there's a 50% chance that these two fragments uh, join, someone should come take a look at it and try to assess that. Okay, another question from Paula. Um, have you or will you integrate the photographs and the squeeze scans uh, at the user end? Um, so the photographs in, of the from the um, American School Collection, um, my understanding is that almost all to all of those are photographs that have already been published. Um, and so most of those are available through the American schools archives, the ASCSA.net. Um, the ones that are not are not because they're of unpublished inscriptions. Um, so we'll certainly we are in touch with and will continue to be in touch with the Agora um, excavation folks to make sure that, you know, if we have materials that they don't have um, or that weren't published in Hesperia or the Agora series of volumes, um, that we get those scanned and, and do make sure that we can make those available. Um, but in the cases that they're already um, published in Hesperia, then those images will, will generally be available through uh, JSTOR um, and in the cases um, that they're just kind of more general photography, they, they tend to be on the, the American School Archive. Um, certainly the squeeze scans, um, both the ones that we do with the 2D scanner uh, and the ones that we do 3D, um, those, the plan is for those to be made available. Um, the ones that are 2D are already being made available and, and will continue to be um, open access over the Albert archive. Um, the photogrammetry um, is a little bit more complicated because the files end up being much larger. Um, so we already, when we scan um, at 600 DPI TIFF, we compress that a couple of times. We bring it down to, to 300 DPI um, and make them JPEGs and put that online because that's more moderately sized for people to be able to download, open in their browser, um, you know, not take up a ton of space. And then if people think that there's um, a particular squeeze that they want to see the archival version of, it's very easy for us to, to send it to them. And that's likely the same approach that we would take with the um, with the photogrammetry is we'll indicate that we have you know um, a mesh and object file all the photography for this squeeze and if you're interested you can get in touch and we'll facilitate a direct transfer of the um, the files um, so that on both sides the um, internet overhead isn't um, too too strenuous. Okay, let's see. Um, Lauren Walker has a question. How long do the imaging processes take? Um, how many can you image in a day approximately using the digitization and the photogrammetry process? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So the scanning is, is pretty quick. Um, so when you watched in the video, that's how long it takes to scan um, a squeeze that was not time lapsed um, at all. So it's about 25 seconds, something like that um, per scan. Um, so for small squeezes that only need to be scanned the two times, you're talking about a minute um, total to do the scan. Um, for larger squeezes, it gets, it gets more. Um, if it's larger, like the one that I showed in the video, uh, you know, that's all of a sudden a minute and a half instead of a minute. Um, if it's one of the ones that I mentioned that's more like five feet by 10 feet, one of the really huge squeezes, um, those take significantly longer in part because 
they tend to be made of many pieces of paper and be fragile. And so we'll have multiple people doing the scanning so that it gets held up and supported. Um, and so one of those can take 10, 15, 20 minutes to scan. But fortunately, you know, there aren't a ton of those in the collection. So that doesn't tend to slow things down too much. Um, so I think our expectation is that it, it's quite feasible to scan um, 60 squeezes in an hour um, and the subsequent photoshopping adjusting takes about the same amount of time. Um, so you can get through 60 squeezes in, in two hours um, of total time. Um, so it really does move pretty quickly. Um, the photogrammetry process takes longer and we're really, one of the main things that we're trying to figure out right now is how much we can automate that um, and how we can automate that so that we can get through as much as we possibly can um, without having to assemble a room size robotic arm assembly or something like that. Um, so when we did uh, photo captures last week, if we were shooting, if you're doing a photogrammetry capture and you're just shooting um, by hand a single squeeze, um, the capture portion probably takes somewhere between two minutes and 10 minutes, depending on um, how many pictures you're taking, how close you are, um, how difficult of a setup you've created for yourself. Um, because if you have it, you know, kind of nicely set up against um, a wall or a piece of poster board, um, it's a lot easier to do than if it's on the floor and you're having to kind of uh, lean over it and, and stabilize yourself and hold a, a relatively heavy camera. Um, so that that portion doesn't take terribly long, but you know, two to ten minutes per squeeze is a lot a lot more than what you have on the the two D side and the workup side on the computer is significantly more intensive. Um, so that's done through a, a program called Agisoft Metashape Pro. Um, and depending again on how many photos you take and um, how high definition you want the end product to be, um, that can take the computer somewhere between four and 10 hours um, to do. So one of the things that we really want to figure out with um, the automation process is how we can take a photo set of say 20, 40 squeezes at once, um, because then the computer can just be set to chunk, work through that, um, and we can cut out essentially uh, the individual um, 3D meshes at the end. Um, so I, I hope that answers the, the question there. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, Paula, you noted that uh, you boost the contrast and reduce the brightness of the scans. Is there a particular metric that you found is best or does it depend on the individual scan? That's a really good question. So um, we actually do not do this by individual scan, um, rather specifically for two reasons. One of them is that um, that process of trying to figure out you know, what's going to look absolutely best ends up taking a bunch of time. Um, and it, that wasn't a place where we wanted people to be spending the, the time on this. Um, and the other thing is that we're, we were concerned with that and with a variety of um, the, the things that we do that we would be reading our biases into it. Um, and so kind of creating something where there isn't necessarily something. Um, so we apply the exact same brightness and contrast adjustments to every single squeeze. Um, and as I mentioned in the video, we keep unaltered versions of them so that if you know, there's any concern um, that by doing so, we've you know, created a letter um, where there wasn't a letter uh, or made it possible to read a letter where, where maybe it's just a mark on the stone, it, you can go back and look at, at the kind of untouched squeeze um, and, and see what you think about that. Um, but yeah, and, and this is another one where um, we have 
several kind of um, documentation manuals of, of how to do this um, stuff. And, and that's all uh, material that I'm very happy to share. So um, if you want to know, you know, kind of what exactly the percent that we bump it up um, or down in Photoshop is, um, I'm, I'm very happy to share that. And uh, it's, it's something where, you know, you can kind of look, play depending on what your scanner is and, and what seems right to you. Um, I think I would recommend doing the same kind of apply the same thing to every squeeze uh, approach, but um, the exact numbers that you apply, uh, that that would be something that, you know, it's not like we have a magic bullet for that. We've kind of just decided on what seemed best to us. Um, okay, a question from um, Georgia. Um, thank you for the presentation. Have you digitized the squeezes of uh, Jean-Louis Robert? Um, so we have not digitized that collection yet. Um, that collection is under the stewardship of Glenn Bowersock and Christopher Jones. Um, and we have planned as, as part of the digitization project to digitize that collection um, for the same reasons as everything else so that it, it can be made available if that's the um, desire of Glenn and Christopher. Um, and so that we have the kind of pres preservation um, of them. So, you know, if anything were, you know, knock on wood, if anything were to go wrong, um, they would be preserved. So we're almost finished actually with doing the, the 2D scanning of the rest of the collection. Um, and when we finish the, the rest of it, um, we'll have we'll sit down and have a, a conversation and see what what they want to do that way um, and and hopefully move forward with that. Um, okay, a question from another question from Laura. Lauren, um, are people using triple I F to match fragments or compare versions? Um, so, our images that we put up online are triple I F compliant. Um, I don't know whether um, anyone has used them yet specifically to um, find joins and, and match um, fragments to each other. I do know that we've had several people who have used the, the squeezes, the images of the squeezes um, for publications that will have new readings uh, of inscriptions um, or for, um, publications um, that are comparing kind of what is currently visible on the stone to what I guess would have been on the stone when the squeeze was made. Because of course, that's another uh, advantage to the squeezes is they were made in, in mostly in 1935, 36. Um, and although there's not a ton of uh, change that happens to um, the squeezes while they're at the, the Agora Museum or the Epigraphic Museum, um, etc. Um, there can be, you know, very small things. And so if you're wondering about, you know, a, a letter, whether it's an Omicron or a Theta or something like that, um, and you're not 100% certain whether what you're seeing is, um, you know, an actual letter or just um, some kind of damage to the stone. Um, you can get a, a check on, hey, this is what the surface looked like um, 80 years ago, see whether that that helps that way. So yeah, the kind of comparing versions, that's definitely happening. Um, the matching fragments, I don't know whether that's going on yet. Um, and we're pretty uh, open that, you know, we want people to use, um, use these images for, for all of their work. Um, and the only thing that we ask is that, you know, if you do a publication with them that you mentioned that the squeeze is from the Institute, and if possible, you send us a digital copy of whatever the, the publication is, so that we know what kind of work is being done with them. So um, we haven't, haven't gotten any uh, articles or book uh, chapters or anything like that yet, specifically um, saying that, that people are doing this, but um, hopefully it's something that's kind of going on in the background. Um, Maria asked, uh, when viewing the images in Albert, how much can you manipulate the image? Yeah, so um, we have an image viewer um, built into Albert that lets you do some amount of uh, image manipulation directly there. Um, specifically, again, you can adjust the kind of brightness and contrast type values of the image there. Um, so you can play with it, 
in browser, you know, just by clicking the way that that I did um, in the video to bring up the image uh, and adjust it that way. You can also download uh, the files for any of the images, um, and then you can adjust them in any of the other myriad ways that that Photoshop lets you play with things in Photoshop. So there are I, what I would say are some basic um, adjustments that you can do. And obviously, when you do these adjustments, they are not they're not done to the file. Um, so you don't need to worry that any anything you do when you're looking at the files uh, in in Albert will affect um, the files that we've got on the database. Um, but there's some basic, um, basic things that you can do with those images to help yourself try to see, um, see what's on them. Uh, and I think although those are basic things, they're probably also some of the most useful things at the end of the day, the, the kind of brightness and contrast is just honestly one of the best ways of trying to see better um, what's in the image. So uh, although you can do other things with Photoshop, it's kind of uh, diminishing returns in some ways. Um, and also what what percent of the collection has already been scanned? Um, so as I was saying, most of it at this point has been scanned. Um, I think we're we're probably up around uh, I would say um, 80 to 90% of the collection has been scanned at this point. Um, and almost all of the material that's been scanned has been Photoshopped um, and, and edited. Um, less of it is available at the moment for two reasons. Um, one of them is, as I, as I mentioned in the video, we like to provide just the kind of a basic amount of metadata usually about the inscription, um, because most of the epigraphists um, and historians and, and classicists who are going to work with these um, aren't necessarily going to want to know or be searching by a squeeze that was made in X year versus Y year. It's the, the information about the squeezes isn't necessarily what's as important as the information about the inscription. So was this uh, an honorific uh, decree? Was this a, um, a, a, a gravestone of some kind? Um, is, was this erected in the fourth century BCE? Was this erected in the you know, second century CE? Um, where was it, where does it come from? Is it, is it Athens? Is it from um, Thessaloniki? That kind of thing. Um, so, collecting that metadata um, and putting that metadata into a, a format where it can be applied to the squeezes um, takes time as well. So we've got kind of a large body of material that we are sort of ready to um, put online and, and open access where we're mostly waiting to update uh, kind of how we display these things in Albert um, and what our sort of underlying uh, infrastructure is that way. Um, but when we get that worked out, and that, as is the case with a lot of things, has been kind of delayed, unfortunately, by the pandemic, um, throwing everybody a wrench. Um, but when that gets worked out, um, we'll have these up online. And one of the, the changes that we're making is we're going to be putting um, all of the kind of metadata that we're gathering, both about the squeezes uh, and about the inscriptions, um, into EpiDoc um, XML. Um, which will allow the that information to be much more easily uh, drawn upon and connected to other digital epigraphy projects, um, since that's kind of the the um, lingua franca of digital uh, epigraphy. Yes, and uh, thank you, Maria. Maria shared the link to the Crateros uh, homepage uh, in the chat. So if you're interested, you can wander by there and that uh, has all sorts of information about um, the project, um, about you know, the, um, how we do the digitization, about the squeeze collection uh, and its history, um, and also has a link to Albert, um, to the, the database um, uh, on there as well, which, which Maria has also linked. Um, and so uh, again, you know, very welcome to do that. You'll notice that we, as I, as I was kind of just uh, alluding to, we have not uploaded new material to Albert uh, in a little while, but we still have several thousand um, images on there already. And at some point, I'm kind of hoping within the next um, couple of months, um, maybe over this summer, there'll be a huge uh, image dump and most of the rest of the um, published material will, will become open access and available. 
A quick question about that, Aaron. Um, how do you advertise that the new collections are available? Yeah, so um, at the moment, um, we haven't done that yet. I think what we will do, um, certainly there is a, a Crateros uh, Instagram page, um, which to this point has mostly just shared uh, images of interesting squeezes and stuff in the collection, uh, along with some historical and um, philological commentary from time to time. Um, and that would be a place where we would mention uh, any large uh, data drops. Um, it'll also be something that we definitely share on the Liverpool Classics Listserv. Um, it'll be something that we're we're actually in the process of creating kind of a, a news um, slash um, you know updates from the team section of the website, um, and that would be a place where we would uh, explain if there was a, a, a large new um, tranche of material released, you know what was in there, um, how to access it, all that kind of thing. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, I see. Um, I think we've taken care of all the questions, right? I don't want to cut anybody short. <laughs> I, I think if, if anyone has a question in there that I didn't see or that I haven't gotten to, please um, feel free to, to speak up. Uh, I'm, I'm not, not, not doing it on purpose. <laughs> Well, in any case, thanks, Aaron, for welcoming us to the Crateros home. It's been <clears throat> amazing. Um, and I really thank for all the effort and the, and the, the care that you put in on the collection. And, and uh, it's been very kind of like, I, although I'm here at the Institute, it's very um, eye-opening to see all the details that I had missed and, and never learned of. Um, and before we say goodbye, I want to uh, mention that on April 14th, in a joint venture with the IAS Near Eastern Studies, uh, we will present Biblioteca Arabica, a digital home for the Arabic manuscript tradition. We thank you all for attending today's sessions and hope to see you all again in future events. And thank you, Aaron, very much for all your effort and of your team. Thank you very much, Maria. And thanks again to all of you for, for coming and for the fantastic questions. Um, and uh, uh, our email address for contact is on the website. If you think of any questions later on that you wish you had asked, send an email. I always keep track of that and I'm, I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions. <laughs>